<laughs> All right, guys, last chapter we are going to cover in microbiology. I know you guys might be thinking that our book does have a couple other chapters in it. Um, I, I end on this one because this one is kind of a summary of the last couple chapters. In chapter 17 today, we are going to take a look at just, just kind of an introduction, some of your common um, infectious diseases that you may run across. And then the next couple chapters cover specifically uh, viral pathogen or viral diseases. And then back, the next chapter would be bacterial. I can't remember if I'm in the correct order or not. It might be bacterial then viral, but then it's the next chapter is fungal. And then the next one is parasitic. So um, specifically focus on that. But like I said, this one is kind of a, just kind of a broad view and kind of an introduction to those chapters. So I always end on this chapter um, because it talks about some of the common ones that you guys may see. Um, and then should you wanna do some further research, you can look more into those later chapters. And you may have already done so already in some of our discussions that we've had. Uh, so this is kind of a short and sweet chapter as the way that I cover it, I really just kind of go through each body system um, in, the, in the body and then talk about some common terms that you guys might see uh, specifically associating with that body system. So for instance, like we'll cover the circulatory system and I'll talk about what are some diseases that affect the circulatory system. So we're not gonna get into every single little disease and what signs and symptoms are of that disease that's really what a lot of those discussions that we did at the beginning were to kind of introduce you guys to different ones as you guys read your classmates discussions and talked about different types of viral infections, bacterial infections and fungal infections. Um, but just the whole idea is just to be familiar with what are some things you could see in you know, each body system. So just kind of like I said, just an introduction to some terms you guys might see when it comes to infectious diseases. So let's take a look. All right, so chapter 17, like I said, kind of short and sweet chapter here, if I can get it going. Okay, so some major infectious diseases of humans. So that's what we're gonna take a look at. Like I said, an overview of just infectious diseases. And then I'm actually, I've got my book in front of me right now. So chapter 18 gets into then the viral, chapter 19 gets into bacterial, chapter 20 does get into then fungal, uh, chapter 21 is parasitic, and then that's the end of the textbook. So it specifically goes into those types of, of diseases if you want to then, you know, read a little bit further. Um, but let's just take a look here at chapter 17. So like I said, we're going to go through each body system, you know, starting with the skin, and we'll go through each of these eyes, ears, respiratory, oral, gastrointestinal, genital urinary. So really, we're just going to go through like I said, each body system and talk about some things that you guys might see in each of these. So again, and we mentioned this at the very beginning of class, pathogens cause two general categories of diseases, microbial intoxications, which is typically through like an ingestion of a pathogen or a toxin. Um, and it, you know, we are, we are then made sick by that toxin uh, or there's infectious diseases where an infectious disease caused by a pathogen that then spreads or colonizes uh, that particular body site. So that's what it mentions here in this bullet, in this bullet point. So the, the colonization of some body site by that pathogen. Some infectious disease can affect more than one anatomical site. Some pathogens can move from one body site to another during the course of the disease. And we will see a couple examples of what I mean by that and how sometimes that can happen when we look over these different um, body systems and you can see how these pathogens can sometimes travel. All right, so let's first take a look at the skin. So infectious diseases of the skin, you wanna be familiar with some of the most common terms relating to these infectious diseases of the skin. So remember your skin is made up of two layers, your epidermis and your dermis. Some, some people include that hypodermis or subcutaneous layer as part of the skin, but really it's just the fat tissue under the skin. So your epidermis and your dermis are your two top layers, are your two main layers of skin, the top and then the living layer is the dermis. So some terms you guys will want to be familiar with, dermatitis. Dermatitis is going to be an inflammation or infection of the dermis itself. You can tell by that term. Remember, itis, remember for medical terminology, itis means inflammation or infection of, and so the prefix sometimes gives away what we're, we're associating that with. So dermatitis is infection of the dermis. So sebaceous glands, this is not a disease. You remember your sebaceous glands 
are the glands that are attached directly to your hair follicles, producing an oily substance called sebum. And that sebum helped to um, make hair soft. It also helped from bacteria growing around the surface of that hair. Uh, so sebum was gonna help with that. Folliculitis, again, because the sebaceous gland is right there at the follicle, sometimes that can become um, clogged or infected and then therefore causing folliculitis, which is gonna be inflammation or infection of that hair follicle. And we're gonna see a picture of the skin on the next slide so we can kind of remind ourselves what I'm talking about with these terms. Okay, so a sty, so some of you guys might be familiar with a sty. A lot of times people get a sty on their eyelid um, and oftentimes people think that a sty must be, a, must be associated with the eye, but actually it is an infection of the skin. It is when that uh, sebaceous gland in the follicle of an eyelash becomes inflamed or infected, um, but it is on the skin. It is, on the, it is associated with that hair follicle on the skin of your eyelid. So a sty is part of the skin or an infection of the skin. So a furuncle, we actually more commonly are familiar with this term as boil. So a boil, also known as a furuncle, is just that pus producing infection in the skin. This is gonna be a very localized infection there. Most of these terms that we're gonna see from here down with most skin, these skin infections, we're gonna see very localized, that meaning that they stay in that area. Okay. Um, a carbuncle, this is going to be a deep-seated infection within the skin, typically resulting from, um, you know, the furuncles, those boils. Sometimes we see some of those. I'm trying to see if in your book you guys have any pictures of those and you do not. Um, but it is a, a little bit more deep-seated um, skin infection. A macule, this is a surface lesion. Um, neither raised nor pressed. It's just a um, just a cell. Uh, kind of looks like a dark spot, but typically uh, lesions caused by measles uh, result in these macules. Whereas a papule, so macule again, not raised at all. A papule is a surface lesion that is going to be firm and raised, such as those produced by chickenpox. A pustule is then very similar, but pus filled. And then a vesicle lastly is a blister. So typically a blister we know is fluid filled, but not filled with pus. So very similar, a lot of these terms are all very similar as we're seeing these as some type of skin lesion on, our, uh, on, on the surface of our skin, our epidermis. Um, so they're all very localized to that spot, uh, but they're all associated. So these terms are associated with the skin. Some common ways that I ask about these terms on um, your, your final exam, guys, uh, I may give you guys a couple of these terms. Um, you know, I may say, you know, dermatitis, a macule, and a pustule are all associated with what body system. So we know that that would be the skin. So you may see some questions like that where I just give you those terms. Uh, in some cases, again, I may want you guys to remember um, the breakdown of the term itself. Like if I gave you guys, um, if I said an inflammation or infection of the dermis, this is called what? And then your option would be dermatitis. So again, breaking down, remember itis, meaning inflammation, um, and then derm, that prefix is the dermis. So I may ask you some specifics with that, but I try to keep them pretty simple and self-explanatory like that. Okay, so again, there's your cross-section of the skin. So remember your epidermis is this very top layer of the skin. And then remember your dermis is, we sometimes call it the living layer of the skin because it contains all your blood vessels, your nerve endings, the different sweat glands, your hair follicles and all, you know, everything of that nature. So again, here's your hair follicle. Remember the sebaceous glands, this purple, that you're seeing here attached to the hair follicle, that's a sebaceous gland or oil gland. And sometimes those follicles can become clogged uh, and infected, um, especially you know, with those sebaceous glands producing that oily substance there. Um, and that's where folliculitis results from. Okay, all right guys. So let's take a look at the ears then. 
So remember the ear, we have um, a couple different pathways for pathogens to enter into the ear. We've got the eustachian tube, which sometimes was called the auditory tube. Remember that was the tube that connects the throat uh, to the ear. So it connects the throat or the, specifically the nasopharynx part of the throat uh, to the ear itself, connecting to the middle ear. Uh, that is a very common pathway for especially when people have throat infections like strep throat or something just in that area. Sometimes pathogens can travel to the ear and sometimes even vice versa for those that have ear infections. Sometimes the, we feel throat pain as well and that's because the pathogens can easily travel through that pathway. Uh, the external ear canal, so pathogens can enter into the ear canal itself and then through the blood or the lymph that's traveling to the ear. So two terms to be associated with uh, the ears itself, otitis, anytime you see otitis, we're talking about the ear. So just infection of, and then specifically media is gonna be the middle ear, and then externa is gonna be the outer ear. Okay, and that's all you wanna be familiar with on the ear. So just those two terms. So once again, here's our cross section of the ear. So those pathways I'm referring to would be the ear canal here is, you know, at first, the, the, as I mentioned, the external auditory canal. And then we have the eustachian tube, as again, it connects the middle ear down to the nasopharynx. Okay, let's take a look at the eye. Remember, the eye was a very complex organ. Um, with the eye, you know, it's, it's really, the eye ha has all kinds of different parts to it. And we try to, you know, our eye tries to protects itself as much as it can. And that, that first protective layer that we did discuss, and unfortunately it's not on this diagram, um, but remember the cornea had a thin, delicate membrane that sat on top of it, and that was called the conjunctiva. And sometimes the conjunctiva can become inflamed and that's where conjunctivitis comes in. So remember the conjunctiva, remember that's the prefix there, and itis meaning inflammation of that. Keratitis is gonna be inflammation of the cornea. And then keratin and conjunctivitis is a combination of the two. When the cornea and the conjunctiva are both affected, we're seeing keratin conjunctivitis. Okay, uh, of the respiratory system. So remember the respiratory system, we had the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. Remember the upper respiratory tract included your sinuses, your throat, your nasopharynx and your oropharynx the epiglottis and the larynx right before you got to the trachea. Once you get to the trachea, your windpipe lower than that, we're reaching then the lower respiratory tract. So here infections are going to be a lot more severe because we've made our way down to, you know, closer to the lungs. So just to show you guys that cross section. So really it's here where we're crossing that off. Anything upper respiratory tract is not seen as as severe. Um, just because again, it's, it's something that it's like the pathogen has only made its way so far is a way to think about that. Um, you know, typically sometimes need to be treated like strep throat would wanna be treated by an antibiotic. Um, whereas then we get to the trachea here and make its way into the bronchi and bronchial tubes of the lungs, we are then seeing much more severe infections, things like bronchitis and pneumonia. So, um, so remember, so we have indigenous microflora of the upper respiratory tract Sometimes they may cause opportunistic pathogens in the respiratory system if they make their way to the lower respiratory tract. Lower respiratory tract infections are actually the most common cause of death from infectious diseases. Okay, so that was just our cross section again, but the terms that you'll wanna be familiar with, um, with the respiratory system, bronchitis. So again, remember the prefix bronch, meaning our bronchi. So those are the tubes that break off into the lungs. When they are inflamed, we see bronchitis. Bronchopneumonia is going to be then affecting the bronchi and then also pneumonia in the lungs, which is typically a fluid buildup uh, and an inflammation within the lungs themselves. So we see that term over here. So bronchopneumonia affects both the lungs and the bronchi. Epiglottitis, remember the epiglottis is that flap of cartilage that closes over top of the trachea when we swallow things like food and liquids. In the event that that gets inflamed, we may, we may Feel that in our throat there, and that's going to be the infection or inflammation of specifically that epiglottis. In laryngitis, individuals are going to have um, an effect on their vocal cords, as again, your larynx is your voice box, so inflammation of that is going to affect that, so that's, your la that's laryngitis. Pharyngitis, very similar, but affecting our throat, so that's above the larynx there. 
Pneumonia, like I said, is in the lungs. Pneumonia is one of the most severe uh, respiratory tract infections because it's specifically affecting the lungs and oftentimes causes a fluid buildup in the lungs uh, with those alveoli in there. It is one of the most common, if you guys remember, of our um, healthcare associated infections too. And sinusitis is going to be a sinus infection. So inflammation or infection in our sinuses. Okay, now let's take a look at the mouth. The mouth is a very interesting organ when it comes to um, microorganisms present there. The oral cavity is a very complex ecosystem suitable for growth of many different microorganisms. The indigenous microflora that we have in our mouth varies from one person to the next, but typically consists of about 300 identified species of bacteria, both aerobic and anaerobic. So it seems crazy to have so much bacteria and, and different microorganisms in our mouth, but they serve a purpose. A lot of those organisms are there to help break down foods right away. And it's just all kinds of jobs that they have. So there's lots of different species of the bacteria in our mouth. But sometimes we can develop infections in our mouth. So we want to be familiar with these. Dental caries, one of the most common infections in the mouth. We commonly refer to these as cavities. We know these that sometimes, uh, typically, dental caries results in the way that the chemical reaction takes place with glucose, as we know, sugar. So when we, have, we eat a lot of sugar, sometimes sugar left on our teeth can sometimes cause the erosion of the enamel and, and that tooth material there uh, resulting in something that needs to be filled. So dental caries is a cavity. So really periodontal diseases are actually everything underneath here. So periodontal diseases is just a broad category for um, diseases in the mouth. Gingivitis is, is one that we oftentimes hear of. But we're always told that we need to floss to make sure that we pre prevent gingivitis um, as that is going to be uh, inflammation in our gums. Periodontitis, on the other hand, is very similar when gingivitis has actually made its way a little bit further uh, past our mouth and actually is going to, not our mouth, I'm sorry, our gums, and is affecting the bone tissue underneath. All right. And then trench mouth, this is a, a common yeast infection in the mouth. Okay. All right, guys, so let's look at our gastrointestinal tract. So general in information in our GI tract, transient and resident microbes continuously enter and leave the GI tract. Most microorganisms, when they make their way to the stomach, are destroyed in the stomach and the, du or the duodenum because of the um, chemicals that are present. Remember, the stomach is filled with hydrochloric acid. Uh, the duodenum has bile and pancreatic juices coming from the liver and the pancreas. Um, so all of these are involved in the breakdown of food, but also can help in the breakdown of pathogens as well. But sometimes we do see some uh, diseases in the GI tract. So terms relating to infectious diseases of the GI tract, we have colitis. If you remember the colon is your large intestine. So inflammation or infection there is going to be colitis. Then we have now diarrhea and dysentery. Um, actually both kind of similar terms, diarrhea as we're familiar with that and dysentery, more watery stools um, are actually more of a symptom to me or a sign that shows that we are experiencing something. Diarrhea has lots of different causes. It, as you can see down here in the bottom could be foods, drugs, or even a microorganism. Um, so really I think those should be separate and not necessarily categorized as infectious diseases, but more so signs and symptoms of different diseases. But oftentimes we see that when we see gastrointestinal reactions. Um, enteritis, enteritis is gonna be inflammation of the intestines, specifically the uh, small intestines, as again, your colitis is your colon. Gastritis is gonna be inflammation or infection of the stomach. Gastroenteritis, you can see the combination of the two is gonna affect both the stomach and the small intestines. And then hepatitis is going to be inflammation or infection of the liver. So some different terms relating to the GI tract. So there's a cross section of our GI tract again. So remember food is making its way down the esophagus into the stomach, hopefully destroyed here in the stomach and the duodenum 
as I mentioned, there's lots of different fluids here in the stomach, especially hydrochloric acid. And then remember the duodenum is receiving different fluids from you know, bile from the liver. And then the pancreas is also secreting pancreatic juices in here that contains lots of different enzymes to help break down food, but hopefully as well as break down um, pathogens. All right, our urinary tract. Urinary tract uh, also has an upper and lower rest, or not rest, just like our respiratory tract. Um, so UTIs can be divided into the two as our upper respiratory tract infections, or I keep saying respiratory, I'm sorry, our upper urinary tract infections are going to be considered more severe because here the pathogen has made its way a little bit further. So it starts from below in this case, making its way from the lower urinary tract, which includes the urethra, um, remember then the bladder and even the prostate in males. But if it goes a little bit further than that, where it's making its way now into the ureters and into the kidneys, that's going to be the upper urinary tract infections. So here are some terms relating to the urinary tract. Cystitis, this is going to be inflammation or infection of the bladder. Nephritis is going to be inflammation or infection in the uh, kidneys. As we know, our nephron is the most common, or not the most common, it's your functional unit in your kidneys. Ureteritis is going to be inflammation or infection in the ureters. Remember, those are the tubes that come out of the kidneys after urine is created that leads into the bladder. Urethritis is the tube leaving the bladder and then goes makes its way to the outside. That's when individuals are voiding or urinating. That's where that will exit from. So when inflamed, we see ure urethritis. And then prostatitis, inflammation in the prostate gland. And then lastly, pleonephritis, also infecting the kidneys. As we talked about before, the most common cause of most of our uh, urinary tract infections are e, e. coli. Uh, so the most common cause of cystitis, that bladder infection and infections in the kidneys are going to be caused by E. coli. Most common cause of urethritis is chlamydia. So affecting the urethra there. All right. And there, once again, is our cross section of our urinary tract. We have um, okay, so we have the upper respiratory. I mean, Again, I keep saying respiratory, respiratory tract, I'm so sorry. Urinary tract, we have the upper urinary tract, which is gonna be the kidneys up here and then the ureters. And then down here at the lower urinary tract would be the bladder, the, we have the prostate in males and then the urethra. So there's, again, just a cross section to remind you guys there what I'm talking about when I say urethritis, prostatitis, cystitis, ureteritis, cystitis, you know, these different terms. I'm sorry, not cystitis, nephritis or pleonephritis. All right. And infections of the genital tract. So some different terms relating to diseases of the genital tract. And this kind of includes uh, your category for both males and females. So it's focusing on both and I'll differentiate between the two. Um, Bartholinitis, if you guys remember um, from anatomy, and I think your all's anatomy book may have called this something different, but there were two glands on either side of the vagina that actually helped with lubrication during sexual intercourse. Those are also referred to as the Bartholin glands. When those particular glands become infected or inflamed, we're seeing Bartholinitis. Cervicitis is going to be inflammation or infection of the cervix, as you can see from the term there. Endometriitis, this is going to affect the endometrial layer of the uterus, is the inner lay, layer of the uterus. Uh, common um, in, in, in a lot of females, I know somebody specifically who has endometriitis and um, has a lot of pretty severe cramps all the time, um, but it is going to cause a lot of pain in that in, endometrius. Here we're looking at um, in the male epididymitis. The epididymis, remember, is the highly coiled up tubule that sits right on top of the um, testes. 
So when in, um, immature sperm leave the testes, they're actually going to mature as they travel through the epididymis, but it too can become infected, and that's epididymitis. All right. Uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, this is specifically referring to um, inflammation in the fallopian tubes. Vaginitis, as you can tell by the term there, inflammation in the vagina. And vulvovaginitis is going to be inflammation that also affects the, not just the vagina, but also the vulva. So the vulva, if you guys remember, is the uh, outer part of the vagina, so affecting the skin and stuff on the outside. All right. And then remember sexually transmitted diseases. So diseases that are spread by sexual contact can also affect the genital tract uh, or cause different in infections in the genital tract. So these diseases are commonly referred to as STDs, include the infections transmitted by sexual activities, um, sometimes these include diseases of not only the genital and urinary tract, but also um, the skin and mucous membranes. Okay, so this, there's our cross-section of the male and female reproductive systems. So once again, you know, again, there's the epididymis sitting on top of the testes. So you can see that what I mean when I say epididymitis. Um, and then we've got, you know, down in the female system, we talked about there, so you can't see it in this cross section here, but there's two glands on either side of the vagina, and that's the Bartholin glands that I'm referring to. Then there's a the vagina there, so vaginitis. And then we have the cervix on the outside of the opening to the uterus there. And then it's that inner layer of the uterus that's our endometrium when I, when I mention uh, endometriitis. Okay. All right. So let's keep going. So infectious diseases of the circulatory system. So the circulatory system consists of the cardiovascular system, um, which would include um, your, again, your heart and the various blood vessels with the heart. Um, and we've got the lymphatic system as well. So the lymphatic um, diseases are actually going to be super easy to remember because you'll see the prefix lymph at the beginning of each of these uh, diseases. So that makes it pretty easy to remember. And your cardiovascular system ones are pretty easy to remember too. If you remember the um, layers of the heart were the endocardium, myocardium, and pericardium. So when we see inflammation or infection in those different layers, they're named accordingly. So we see endocarditis, which is going to be on the inside of the heart, myocarditis affecting the muscular layer of the heart, and then the pericardium or the outside layer, we'll see pericarditis. Blood is typically sterile, so we're typically not seeing a lot of inf infections in the blood. Again, remember, we did talk about the term septicemia. To remember with sepsis, that's when we see bacteria present in the blood. And then terms relating to the lymphatic system. So once, uh, once again, these are pretty easy to remember. As we see, lymphodentitis is going to be inflammation of the lymph nodes. Lympho, uh, lymphadenopathy is going to be diseased lymph nodes, and lymphagi lymphagitis is going to be lymph our lymph vessels are going to be affected there. All right, and there's our circulatory system. So once again, a cross section of our heart reminding you guys there's the layers down here at the bottom, endocardium, myocardium, and epicardium, sometimes referred to as the pericardium. When those particular layers become inflamed, that's where we were seeing the endocarditis, myocarditis, and then pericarditis. Okay. All right, let's take a look at the central nervous system. So the nervous system is composed, again, of the central nervous system, which is your brain and your spinal cord, which is going to include the meninges on the outside of those two organs. So those are your three membranes. We'll discuss those. And then the peripheral nervous system. Um, so that's going to be the nerves that extend from there. So there's typically no indigenous microflora of the nervous system, so nothing that could potentially become opportunistic pathogens. Um, so we don't have to worry about that, but there are sometimes illnesses that can affect our central nervous system, and here's what we're looking at here. So encephalitis is going to be inflammation of the brain, 
encephalomyelitis. So myelin, remember, is um, part of our neuron that is is the um, when we think of the term myelin. But this is very much going to affect the spinal cord when we see myelitis. So remember, myelitis is going to be the spinal cord, so the combination of the two there. Meningitis is going to be inflammation in our meninges. Remember, our meninges are the three protective layers on the outside of our brain and spinal cord. If you guys recall the dura matter, arachnoid matter, and pia matter of those three membranes, that's what those are referred to as our meninges. Okay, and then meningoencephalitis is going to be your meninges and your brain as well. So again, the combination of the two. And then, as I mentioned earlier, myelitis is going to be specifically associated with the spinal cord. All right, so once again, there's our central nervous system, our brain, and then our spinal cord. So encephalitis and myelitis and encephalomyelitis, whereas then our meninges, we can see if we take a cross section of the brain here, you can see we've got the dura matter. So the dura matter, sorry, the tough outer layer here. The, uh, oh, sorry here, if I could point correctly, the arachnoid matter and then the pia matter. So those are our meninges. So that's where meningitis comes in. So remember meningitis is inflammation of the meninges. There are many different causes of meningitis, including sometimes an ingestion of poisons, uh, an ingestion or injection of some type of drug, reaction to a, vac a vaccine or a pathogen of some sort. Uh, so there's all kinds of different types there's lots of different causes to bacterial meningitis, as you can see here, some common ones um, that you guys may come across when you see that bacterial meningitis is that's very, very severe because of the fact that, again, your meninges sit on top of your brain and spinal cord. But meningitis is just one that, again, I want to mention that does have many causes. All right. Um, with opportunistic infections and opportunistic pathogens, we are familiar with those, that they are sometimes our indigenous microflora that, given the right opportunity, can become infections. Uh, so those are microbes that usually don't cause disease but have the potential to do so. So your common opportunistic infections um, that you guys may come across, as I really I kind of mentioned at the beginning, that we're not going to have to worry too much about specific diseases. I really wanted to focus on... Um, you know, just kind of the broad categories of the diseases associated with, with each body system and to be familiar with, again, the breakdown of the terms that, you know, encephalitis means inflammation of the brain. Um, let's not worry too much about your common opportunistic pathogens, but I do want you again to be familiar with what those are as a lot of times as we cover your common infectious diseases that sometimes it is caused by, um, you know, an opportunistic pathogen. Okay, and let's skip the emerging and re-emerging infections and we'll end there. Okay, so guys, I really, you know, again, in that chapter, I want you guys to just focus on, you know, as again, I may ask on the final, I may give you guys just a couple different terms and ask you guys, what body system are these terms associated with? So if I said laryngitis, bronchitis, and pneumonia, what body system are those diseases gonna affect? I'm looking for the respiratory system. Um, I may say, you know, if I said gastritis and hepatitis, what body system are we affecting there? That's going to be the digestive tract or the gastrointestinal tract. You'll have, again, choices with these multiple choice questions. Um, and then again, because we talked a little bit about the breakdown and remember the different terms, that itis, we know that we saw itis so often today, meaning inflammation or infection. And then the prefix kind of tells you what that means. So if I said, again, if I gave you dermatitis, we know that that's going to be inf an infection of what? The dermis, you know, or conjunctivitis is infection in the conjunctiva, so in the eye. Uh, so you'll have those options, but again, helping to break down those terms, I'd be familiar with some of those. All right, guys, that's the end to ch of chapter 17. If you guys have any questions, let me know.